in this installment of my Disney Villains Retrospective, we're looking at the greedy foes that opposed Robin Hood. Disney's 1973 movie retold the classic English folktales with a cast of animals playing the parts. As always, before we talk about the lions, reptiles, wolves, and other Disney critters, we'll first look at the source material. This time it's going to be a little different since our main villain, Prince John, was a real person. The thing is, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the prince in real life. The Robin Hood legends appear to have taken a lot of liberties with him. It doesn't look like John was a particularly good person, but he probably wasn't the incompetent monster that we see in most media. We have the real John, and then we have the folklore John. Unlike Disney's drastic liberties that they took with, say, Pocahontas' story, I can't pin the vilifying of John on them. That was being done centuries before their movie. With this in mind, I'll still lay out some brief facts about the real Prince John before we look at the more relevant story version. John was born in 1166, the youngest son to his father, King Henry II. He was not set to inherit any of his father's territories, and was even nicknamed Lackland by the king. Later, when his brother, Richard I, joined the Holy Crusade, John tried to steal the English throne in his absence. This served as the basis for the Robin Hood legends. However, when Prince John failed in his attempts, his brother actually forgave him. That's about as far as I'm going to go into the real John's life, since it's the most relevant to Robin Hood. In those stories, Prince John essentially became a stock tyrant character, someone for the good guys to rally against. As I said, this is not meant to be a video about the real John's character, it's about the stories. The Robin Hood legends largely take place while Richard is off on the Crusades. Prince John, put in charge of the kingdom in his brother's absence, relentlessly taxes his citizens. With no money left, many of them face starvation and hunt for food in Sherwood Forest. This often results in them becoming outlaws, since killing the forest's deer is against the law. Robin Hood leads a particular band of outlaws, the Merry Men, in defiance of the false ruler. They famously rob from the rich and give to the poor, all while praying for King Richard's eventual return. Although Prince John is the one in charge, Robin Hood spends most of his time fighting his second-in-command, the Sheriff of Nottingham. The Sheriff may be strong and has many soldiers, but Robin and his men are much more clever. No matter what tricks or traps John and the Sheriff devise, Robin Hood always comes out on top. If you've watched my Madame Mim video, as a bonus, I covered an unproduced Disney film. Walt had wanted to adapt the story of Reynard, the trickster fox, for quite a while. He was faced with several story challenges, the biggest one being taking a rogue like Reynard and selling him as a hero. They tried several different plot ideas, where the fox would be pitted against thieves and conspirators, and would have to use trickery to prevail. The movie was eventually shelved, but the idea of a crafty fox using deceit for good would be revived with Robin Hood. Some of the character designs, like the rhino guards, and even a few gags, were also recycled. When trying to summarize Disney's Robin Hood, you realize that it has a rather slim plot. It's mostly a series of loosely connected events in Sherwood Forest and Nottingham, although things certainly escalate. As in the legends, Prince John has taken the throne while good King Richard is away. Taxes are at an all-time high, with only Robin Hood being able to steal back any of the ill-gotten money. Each time Robin pulls one over on John, taxes get steeper, until practically everyone winds up in the dungeon. Robin pulls off a final major theft and a jailbreak, freeing the townspeople. King Richard returns shortly afterward, and the villains get their just desserts. What the movie lacks in an intricate storyline, it makes up for with its colorful cast. Almost everyone has a moment to steal the spotlight, but even in a sea of likable characters, it is the villains who stand out the most. We will start our rundown with that scurvy Prince John. According to animators Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, most of Prince John's persona came as a result of his voice actor, Peter Ustinov. In their book, The Disney Villain, the men explain that the initial versions of Prince John, Sir Hiss, and the Sheriff of Nottingham were all basically written as the same character, imposing, but not much else. The animators directly turned to their voice actors to help flesh them out and make them distinct. Prince John was always meant to be paranoid about losing the throne he stole from his brother, but Ustinov took it a step further. The paranoia made way for neuroses, and the mother of all inferiority complexes. And I do mean mother. Almost anything can get under John's skin. The quickest way to anger him is to mention King Richard, but the quickest way to reduce him to a nervous, blubbering wreck is to mention his mother. Add in his oral fixation with his incessant thumb-sucking, and you've got Freud's favorite Disney villain. 
Mother always did like Richard best. <laughs> King Richard is also voiced by Ustinov. We only see him briefly, but he's large, masculine, and noble. Prince John is the polar opposite. Short, stereotypically effeminate, and childish. I'd say the most emphasis is put on the childish part. Some of the effeminate angle just comes from the rich decadence of the royal lifestyle, especially for someone like John who likes to indulge in his wealth. Not that there's anything wrong with being on the smaller side or not being the most masculine. It's really only a shortcoming in John's own eyes when comparing himself to his much more imposing brother. There's a lot of self-loathing going on. Again, Richard embodies the ideal noble type in a physical sense. As an adult male lion, he also has a full mane. Prince John lacks a mane entirely. He can't even get Richard's crown to properly rest on his head. While his lack of mane makes a lot of sense symbolically, there's another reason. Prince John was actually designed as a tiger first. Concept art shows him looking more or less the same as the final movie, but with stripes. I'm guessing part of the reason they changed him was to match his brother. Richard's a lion, so John should be as well. Of course, Maid Marian's their niece, and she's a fox, so who knows. The other factor in John's change of species was practicality. Sheer Khan's stripes in the Jungle Book apparently caused a bit of a headache. They wanted to avoid them when they could. O'Malley from the Aristocats was redesigned for the same reason. He was meant to have stripes as well, which even made it into some test animation. Did their mother really favor Richard over John? Or is this merely the prince's fragile ego talking? We'll never truly know, but we do know that everyone else likes Richard better. Prince John may be acting as the king, but the true king is still Richard. The only reason Richard is away is because John's right-hand snake, Sir Hiss, hypnotized him into setting off on the Crusades. Not only has John stolen the throne, but he's a pale imitation of his benevolent brother, caring more about wealth and power than being a good ruler. That's what irks John the most. His position grants him many things, but the biggest thing he lacks is the respect of his people. That's something that needs to be earned, and nothing John's done has gotten him any goodwill. What truly sets him off is the townspeople singing a catchy, mocking song, calling him the phony King of England. Even his own underlings sing it behind his back. Petulant and childlike as he is, John is still in power, and that earns everyone an even steeper hike in taxes. That ties into why Prince John hates Robin Hood so much. Of course, anyone in a position of ill-gotten power would hate Robin Hood. However, it's not just that Robin regularly steals from the royal treasury, it's the humiliation that really fuels the prince's fire. Everyone loves Robin Hood, just as much as they love King Richard. Even when the outlaw is at the prince's mercy, he leads the people in a cheer for the rightful king. Since Robin Hood is so good at evading the sheriff and his men, Prince John realizes the only way to get him is to set a trap. We see him try to trap Robin twice in the movie, but based on Hiss's exasperated reactions, we can infer he's tried many other times in the past. One deleted plotline involved John trying to lure Robin into the open using forged love letters. One is delivered to the outlaw with Marion's signature, while the other is given to Marion with Robin's signature. The plan is to have them meet in a specific area where an assassin will shoot Robin with an arrow. Disturbingly, when Hiss points out that Marion could be a witness, John just says they'll shoot her too. It doesn't matter if it's his own niece or a man of the church like Friar Tuck. No one will stand in John's way when it comes to getting even with Robin Hood. Like many classic villains, John's hatred of the hero becomes an obsession, clouding his judgment. In a very telling scene, we see John surrounded by his money, wearing a scowl. It doesn't matter how many riches he's stolen, how many people he's punished, he wants Robin Hood. As intense as his hatred toward Robin is, the hero and villain never really get a proper fight. Most of this can be attributed to John's lack of actual combat skill and lack of spine. The closest thing we get is in the tournament scene, where John tries to get Robin in the back with a sword. Robin knocks the weapon away, and the cowardly prince immediately turns tail letting his men take care of things instead. Similarly, the final escape from the castle is exciting, but Prince John still doesn't do much other than barking orders at his many guards. Interestingly, there's an idea for an extended ending that would have given Prince John a chance to be truly menacing. In the final movie, it appears that the royal archers shoot Robin as he leaps to safety, but it turns out he's fine. In the planned ending, Robin really would have been injured and hidden in the church tended to by Maid Marian. Prince John and Sir Hiss would find them and sneak inside. The prince would raise a dagger to kill the unconscious hero, and presumably Marion as well. At the very last second, King Richard would return, royally chew out his sniveling brother, and save the day. 
It stands to reason that the only way someone like John could have a chance at personally killing Robin Hood would be for Robin to be completely incapacitated. I imagine that this ending was vetoed as being too dark. The animators were specifically aiming to make a feel-good, upbeat movie. However, in their Disney Villains book, Thomas and Johnston do admit that in retrospect, Robin Hood was a little too good at what he did. There's rarely a moment in the movie where he's in any real danger, and the few instances he does get in a jam, he's bailed out immediately. Even more telling is a story from animation legend Don Bluth in his autobiography. After watching a work-in-progress cut of the movie, he asked Frank Thomas, another animation legend, what he thought. Thomas responded that they made a mistake. In his words, Ustinov was entertaining as a comedian, and his French fop take on the character was so convincing that we let him run with it. By the time we needed a mean villain at the climax of the story, it was too late. Robin Hood is an entertaining movie, but it does have its weak spots, and I think Thomas was right when it came to dropping the ball at the climax. Not every story needs a threatening villain. Not every story needs a villain, period. But Robin Hood is such a dashing hero that it feels a little hollow at points because he doesn't have a credible threat to rise against. Our next villain is Prince John's right-hand snake, Sir Hiss. Hiss was originally conceived as a more threatening character, a spy for the prince who could potentially be hiding anywhere. For this reason, he was just as feared by the people of Sherwood as any of the prince's other dark forces. Fresh off of animating Ka, who was sometimes threatening in his own right, the animators opted to go in a different direction. Hiss became ineffective, sympathetic, practically cute, and oddly fuzzy. He did share one thing in common with Ka, aside from, you know, being a snake. Both characters have hypnotic powers. Unlike Ka, Hiss is only seen using his once, before being promptly shut down by Prince John. We are told that it was Hiss who hypnotized King Richard into going on his crusades. That means it's Hiss who's really to blame for most of the trials that the good guys face. While Hiss does receive proper punishment for his misdeeds at the end, alongside the other main villains, in some ways he also gets punished throughout the movie. Since Hiss is so complicit in John's treachery, it makes sense that he's always by the monarch's side. Unfortunately, that's not a very good place to be. Prince John repeatedly takes his frustrations out on the poor snake, who's powerless to fight back. He's in too deep, and to leave Prince John would either mean poverty, the dungeon, or death. But even though Hiss arguably deserves it, the sheer amount of abuse he takes quickly switches from hilarious to downright sad, and then back again. A lot of this is owed to his animation. Hiss is a very expressive snake, not only with his pathetic facial expressions, but also his body language. The animators really outdid themselves with how much a character with no arms or legs can physically emote. His voice actor, Terry Thomas, had a lot of fun making him a sniveling little character, but also injected some real pathos into his lines. Creepy. Buster. Long one. Who's that dopey duke think he is? There's a lot of slapstick all around in Robin Hood, but Hiss really seems to get it the worst. We've seen sidekicks take abuse before, but no one thus far has had it quite as bad as Hiss. Maleficent's goons got a terrific thrashing in one scene, but otherwise managed to stay on her good side. Horace and Jasper mostly suffered from being verbally chewed at by Cruella. Gideon took a few whacks from Foul Fellow, but didn't seem to mind all that much. Br'er Fox thought of himself as being in charge, but probably took more beatings from Br'er Bear than he gave. The closest we've really come so far has been Smee, but like Br'er Bear, he gave plenty of pain right back to Captain Hook. The difference is, Smee did it accidentally. Also, it never seemed to register to Smee that his captain was angry with him. He's too stupid to comprehend it. He loves Captain Hook, and does his best to please him out of a sense of duty, and even friendship. Hiss, on the other hand, knows he's entirely dependent on Prince John. He wants to stay in his good graces because he has no other choice. We'll see more sidekicks like this in years to come. Creeper from The Black Cauldron and LeFou from Beauty and the Beast come to mind. They gain nothing from staying with their bosses. Their position as the main villain's toady earns them the scorn of the other henchmen, and abuse from the big guy in charge. Some of his attributes were even based on employees the animators knew who used to suck up to Walt Disney. They hadn't liked these guys, and there was probably a sense of catharsis to make them into this lowly snake who could never please his boss enough. The saddest part is that Hiss is the smartest of the three villains. He knows Prince John's traps never work. He realizes that the fortune tellers are frauds right away. He doesn't know they're Robin Hood and Little John, but he at least knows they're trying to rob the prince. He also seems to have some limits to his villainy. 
Although he's fine with robbing and imprisoning citizens, he's horrified at the idea of hanging Friar Tuck. In the deleted scene where Prince John suggests killing Maid Marian, he's equally appalled, but powerless to truly speak up. Later, when Robin Hood survives his escape from the castle, Hiss actually seems a little amused by the whole thing. Despite his relative intelligence, Hiss doesn't know when to shut up. He loves saying I told you so to the infuriated prince, which is of course the absolute last thing he should say. Like Prince John, Hiss never learns from his mistakes. I'd like to thank one of my viewers, Kiwi Kenobi 2, for letting me know that there's a terrific write-up about Sir Hiss in the book Illusion of Life. The animators really went into detail on development of this character, which helped a lot in this video. The best part was a passage by Ollie Johnston. I have to plan carefully so that every frame means something. I must make the audience feel what I feel. I may never have an opportunity like this again. It is not often that we have a sympathetic villain like Hiss. This makes him a different and richer character. I like to think about how he feels about Prince John. I know he doesn't like him. Many times I think about this miserable existence we have forced upon Hiss, and I feel sorry for him. I wonder if I should have Prince John hit him so hard. I also wonder if there isn't something I should do so that he could gain a little self-respect. But then I realize he is what he is, and I would be weakening his relationship with the prince if I made him a stronger personality. The best I could do for him was to let him have his fleeting moments of happiness, those moments when his world was right. This quote really shows how much love and thought and work the animators put into their craft. The characters were drawn with passion, and it shows. Sometimes you have to suffer for your art, but you can always make your character suffer more. Just ask Sir Hiss. Hiss might be the closest to Prince John, but his main enforcer is the Sheriff of Nottingham. The character was first designed as a goat. Although goats are sometimes viewed as creepy and associated with the devil, they're not generally seen as truly intimidating animals. Making the most imposing character a goat was an effort to do something a little outside the box, like how Sir Hiss became a sympathetic snake. Ultimately, they decided to go the tried and true route and make him a menacing wolf. Meanwhile, if they made this movie in the 2020s, the sheriff would be a goat, and he would punctuate all his lines with a because, you know, if it's funny once, it's funny 15 times. The sheriff is certainly a bully, and really loves to assert his authority. Early concept art shows him as being a truly monstrous figure. Once again, this changed when his voice actor was hired. Pat Buttram gave the sheriff a distinct southern drawl, and made him act very friendly most of the time. Of course, the friendliness was entirely false. The sheriff will make polite conversation while robbing the townspeople blind. He claims he's only doing his job, which is true, but the pleasure he takes in swindling folks is entirely his own. There's also a few moments when it seems like he's going even more out of his way to steal than even Prince John ordered. He takes a single coin from a child on his birthday, the loose change from blind man's can, and later another coin from the otherwise empty charity box in the church. I don't think Prince John would have objected to any of these, but the ideas most likely came from the sheriff's own greedy mind first. Th 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 that's the poor box! It sure is, and I'll just take it for poor Prince John. <laughs> Every little bit helps. The sheriff is certainly clever when it comes to sniffing out hidden money. Unfortunately for him, he prides himself on being truly smarter than he really is. He has just as much of a grudge against Robin Hood as Prince John does, and is confident that only he can outthink the outlaw. Robin is always able to fool the sheriff with his tricks. With a little bit of flattery, the disguised Robin can easily make the sheriff let his guard down. In this way, the sheriff is very much like Prince John. The way to their heart is through their ego. The men are starved for the praise they feel they deserve, making it easy for Robin and Little John to get their gold using the right words. Unlike Prince John, the sheriff does manage to get something of a final battle with Robin Hood. It's still very brief, but during their fight, the sheriff accidentally sets the castle on fire, which doesn't make things easy on our hero. The sheriff's fate changed a few times during production. In the ending where Prince John tried to kill Robin directly, the sheriff actually seems to get let off the hook. He can be seen watching the wedding of Robin and Marion brought to tears. In a set of storyboards that mostly resemble the final movie, the sheriff is seen as a prisoner. This version mentions that Prince John and Hiss disappeared after Robin's jailbreak, and haven't been seen since. I'm not sure if the implication was that they died in the fire or what, but I think most of us can agree that it's much more satisfying to see all three villains getting justice at the end of the movie. The sheriff, who took such sick pleasure in his work, deserves just as much punishment as his bosses. 
The same cannot really be said of all the other guards working for Prince John. While some of them are possibly as evil as the guys at the top, plenty of them really are just doing their job, unpleasant as it might be. Although this rules much of the guards out as being true villains in the way our main trio is, they're still villain-adjacent enough that they should be talked about as well. The thing is, whether they're evil or not, they're the reason Prince John is such a threat. Without these countless soldiers at his disposal, he has no real power. The guards that get the most focus are a pair of vultures, Trigger and Nutsy. Trigger seems to be the sheriff's closest ally. He's on hand for the arrest of Friar Tuck, and later works closely with the sheriff on the night that Robin and Little John break in. Trigger more or less acts as an equivalent of Sir Hiss. He's smarter than his boss, finds the disguised Robin Hood to be suspicious, and gets ignored and abused for his attempts to help. For all Trigger's competence, his boss has to always be the smartest person in the room. It's true that at times Trigger can be something of a liability. His trusty crossbow, Old Betsy, nearly shoots the sheriff when the safety is supposedly on. This is most likely not the first time this has happened. Trigger's voice actor, George Lindsay, played a character with a similar dynamic with a Pat Buttram character in the previous Disney movie, The Aristocats. They were the two southern hounds that popped up a few times. Pat Buttram voiced Napoleon, the supposed leader, who really wasn't all that smarter than his companion, Lafayette. This is not the case with the other vulture, Nutsy, voiced by Ken Curtis. He's just as stupid as his name implies, and proves to be absolutely no help most of the time. Out of all the disorganized guards we see in the movie, he's probably the least competent, which really says something. The captain of the guard seems a little bit more sinister. This could be by virtue of being a crocodile, or by having the gravelly baritone of Candy Candido. He acts as the master of ceremonies for the archery contest, and later joins in both major fight scenes. The most numerous and imposing guards are the rhinos. Prince John certainly didn't skimp when it came to muscle. They're the only ones who ever manage to subdue Robin Hood when they take him by surprise. There's also an extra sinister rhino executioner seen only for a few seconds. Unfortunately for John, the rhino's massive bulk does not always translate to competence. Once they start charging, it's very hard to get them to stop, and it's usually the other bad guys who end up suffering. Similar to the Rhino Guards, there's also a squadron of wolf archers who work with the Sheriff. Their aim is supposedly improving, but it's still never enough to snare Robin Hood. Finally, there are some elephants and hippos who make up a good deal of Prince John's royal procession. They're close in size to the Rhinos, but seem only to be there for pomp and circumstance. How evil these characters are is really up for interpretation. Neither Trigger or Nutsy seem to be truly bad. Trigger takes his job seriously, but it seems to be only from a sense of duty to whoever's in charge. Nutsy just doesn't have the capacity to tell right from wrong. At the end of the movie, they still have their jobs, and are now overseeing the main villains in the Rock Quarry. The other assorted guards do some questionable things that can't always be chalked up to their job. The archers fire madly at the escaping prisoners, including children. The captain swings an axe at an elderly couple. I assume King Richard sorted them all out when he got home. It should be noted that in a storyboard for the ending scene, the Rhinos are present for Robin and Marion's wedding. It would make sense to keep at least some of these guys around. Now that Robin Hood's off on honeymoon, good King Richard will need all the help he can get. Many of these villains would go on to appear in the House of Mouse series. Practically everyone showed up here at some point, which is why I don't always discuss the show in these entries. I'm mentioning it here because Prince John and the Sheriff both had speaking roles provided by Kevin Michael Richardson and Bill Farmer, respectively. Don't worry, your highness. No one's gonna touch your gold while I'm around. <clears throat> Somebody stole my gold! Following the movie's release, a series of Robin Hood comics were published. The stories generally took place before or during the movie, which gave Robin ample opportunities to outwit Prince John and his forces. Everyone was generally written in character here, and behaved just like their movie counterparts. In addition to the usual gang of foes, there were a few original villains created for the series. One of these was King Churl the Cruel, an enormous guerrilla warlord living in a misty forest. Like I've said, these comics could often get weird. The Duke of Darkmoor and the Baron de Milan were both pigs. The Baron has a magic ring that can show him anything he wants. He offers to give Prince John the ring if he could marry Maid Marian. The prince, of course, wants to use it to find Robin Hood's hideout. Luckily, Robin and his men are able to stop the wedding and hide the ring away so no one can ever use it. In a different story, Robin and Prince John are forced to work together, at least to an extent. 
a group of bandits rob the royal jewels, which both Robin and John want to recover. Prince John sees it as his treasure, while Robin Hood sees it as belonging to King Richard. Once Robin and Little John return the goods, the truce is off, and they have to narrowly escape the guards, as always. In a comic written specifically for newspapers, Prince John outlaws Christmas in Nottingham, the one day when his people are truly happy. When Santa Claus himself tries to appeal to the prince, he ends up in the dungeon. The only way to free him is to pay a large ransom. Santa is saved, of course, but surprisingly, it's not by Robin Hood, who doesn't even appear. Instead, the rescue is performed by Skippy the Rabbit and Dumbo. Don't think about it too hard. Dressing as a ghost, it almost appears as if they're going to pull a Christmas carol, but instead, they just threaten to drop John in the moat if he doesn't let Santa go. Sometimes the direct route works best. Prince John, Sir Hiss, and the Sheriff have appeared more recently in some European comics. Unfortunately, I don't have the time, effort, or language skills to translate all these. This is one of those cases where the American audience gets the short end of the stick. Prince John also appeared as the titular role in a book adaptation of The Emperor's New Clothes. The vain, foolish, easily flattered Emperor is the perfect role for him. The Swindlers are not Robin Hood and Little John, as you might suspect, but are instead played by Foulfellow and Gideon from Pinocchio. As long as we're on the subject of crossovers... Okay, bear with me. This one's really obscure, but I have to share it. In the late 70s, Disney published a series of four story-a-day books for each season of the year. In addition to stories, there would be jokes on half the pages delivered by Disney characters. It was your standard Bazooka Joe stuff. One of them looked like it was meant to be an exchange between Trigger and Nutsy. From what I can guess, the typist made a mistake and left out one of the R's in Trigger's name. Thus, instead of Nutsy and Trigger, we get Nutsy and Tigger. There has never been a Robin Hood video game, nor have the characters appeared in Kingdom Hearts. At least, not yet. In fact, the most substantial video game appearances these guys have made were in a mobile game. Disney's Magic Kingdoms is a game I've generally overlooked in these videos, but I'll have to change that. The Virtual Kingdom is bursting with Disney characters, all with delightfully written dialogue. Whoever writes for this game really knows their material. Prince Sean and Sir Hiss are the only two villains to appear, acting in their usual greedy, pathetic roles. John even expresses hope that someday his mane will finally grow in. Some of their little storylines are based on the old Robin Hood legends. In one quest, Prince John hears about a butcher who is willing to sell cattle for a low price. He heads into Sherwood to take advantage of the deal, but finds out too late that there are no cattle, and the butcher was, of course, Robin Hood. In another, Sir Hiss tries to infiltrate Robin's band, and pretends to be a traveler from Gisborne. When asked what his name is, he realizes he forgot to think of one, and says he's just a guy, which doesn't fool anyone. This is a reference to Guy of Gisborne, an antagonist in the original stories who never appeared in Disney's version. On the bright side, once Robin and Little John empty the castle's vaults, Hiss finally has a place to sleep that's not at the foot of his snoring monarch's bed. Outside of that, some of the villains have made minor appearances in games like Disney Infinity, Sorcerer's Arena, and Disney Heroes Battle Mode. Most of the Robin Hood characters have appeared at some point as walkarounds at the theme parks. Sir Hiss, being a snake, would not really be feasible, but Prince John and the Sheriff of Nottingham have popped up from time to time. More unexpected were costumed versions of Prince John's guards, who were used in parades and shows in the 70s and 80s. There has never been much with the characters beyond this, but there was a Robin Hood dark ride in the planning stages when the movie came out. It was axed when the Imagineers realized that although the characters were memorable, the setting was not. Sherwood Forest and Prince John's Castle were not vibrant enough to build an attraction around, not like Neverland or Wonderland. Of course, in today's theme park climate, which relies heavily on IPs, I don't know if that principle is really valued as much. Now that we've covered Disney's most well-known version of Robin Hood, we'll take a quick look at the villains from their other takes on the story. Disney had actually made a live-action Robin Hood in 1952, predating the animated film by over 20 years. The story of Robin Hood and his Merry Men has a more subdued, but still undoubtedly evil Prince John, played by Hubert Gregg. The Sheriff of Nottingham, played by Peter Finch, is quite ruthless, and certainly gives Robin a good fight. Both these characters are closer to the original legends, and not played for comedy like their animal counterparts. In 2001, Disney premiered a made-for-TV movie called Princess of Thieves. This acted as a sequel to the Robin Hood stories. King Richard has died, and his son Philip is set to take the throne. 
Prince John makes one last attempt at snatching the crown himself by ordering Philip's murder. Not only does he have to contend with Robin Hood, but also Robin and Marion's daughter. In this movie, Prince John is played by Jonathan Hyde, and the Sheriff of Nottingham is played by Malcolm McDowell. The Once Upon a Time series also had the Sheriff of Nottingham appear in a few episodes, played by Will Treval. Over in the funny pages, Mickey has starred in several Robin Hood stories himself, facing a different foe each time. In 1936, a story arc in Mickey's Sunday comic strip had the mouse working as a chemist on his garden. After a strange series of mishaps, Mickey accidentally shrinks himself and gets chased down by an unruly oversized housefly. He hides inside a Robin Hood book and finds himself literally pulled into the story. Although the Sheriff of Nottingham does make an appearance, it's actually Robin Hood himself who ends up being more of an antagonist. Not that Mickey doesn't bring some grief onto himself. This is the early, scrappier version of the character who's more open to picking fights. At first, his attitude endears him to Robin, but once Mickey finds out he's expected to steal from others, he wants to back out. Unfortunately for him, Robin Hood won't take no for an answer. Later, after rescuing a damsel who bears a striking resemblance to Minnie, Mickey is ordered to marry her. Knowing he's in a storybook, he refuses to marry an illustration. Robin and his men don't take kindly to his defiance, and the mouse barely escapes the book with his life. The story was redrawn in 1955, but essentially followed the same script, with the same harrowing outcome. In the 60s, Walt Disney's comics and stories had a feature called Walt Disney Theater, with the characters doing their own retellings of classic stories, often with a shortened humorous slant. It felt a bit like the precursor to Mickey's Christmas Carol. In 1966, Mickey was the hero of their Robin Hood parody. Baby Prince Michael is left in the woods to die, while Baron Black, played of course by Pete, takes the throne. Once king, the Baron begins relentlessly taxing his citizens as per tradition. Prince Michael, meanwhile, has been found and raised by the Seven Dwarfs. When he fights against the taxmen, he's arrested and taken to the castle. One of the maids, Snow White, recognizes him as the true royal heir. Taking the name Bobbin Hood due to his apparent buoyancy, Mickey prevails against the Wicked King. Then there was a 1976 story that was essentially a sequel to the Robin Hood legends. This one featured another version of the Sheriff, played by a generic dog-faced thug. The Sheriff has left Nottingham after being bested by Robin, and moves to the neighboring village of Blottingham. Right away, he does what he does best, robbing the villagers blind. Inspired by Robin Hood, Mickey and Goofy outwit the Sheriff, and save the royal treasury. Finally, there was a Muppet Robin Hood adaptation in 2009. The Muppets had already done a take on Robin Hood on The Muppet Show, with Gonzo as the Sheriff of Nottingham. That was before Disney owned them, however. In the comic, Gonzo is still a villain, this time playing Guy of Gisborne. Sam the Eagle is the stuffy Sheriff of Nottingham. Big Bad Prince John is played by Johnny Fiamma, with his monkey, Salmonella, by his side. Uncle Deadly rounds things off as the Captain of the Guard. Although Johnny was most likely cast as a joke because of his name, he actually makes for a good main villain. His Italian lounge singer persona gives Prince John a mafioso touch, and he plays well off his harebrained and competent henchman. Definitely a recommended read. The next Disney animated movie to come out was The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. However, we've already covered the Pooh franchise. The next movie we'll be covering is The Rescuers, along with its eventual sequel. At the same time, I'm working on a general catching up video to talk about subjects I either missed or recent developments since I've started this retrospective. That's right, folks. I'm finally talking more about Twisted Wonderland and the Pinocchio remake. Get ready. I don't know if I am. Get out of that if you can.